So the first panel is the history of resilience and the sociology of climate change. We have a wonderful panel of Harvey Malik, who's sitting up in front, Klaus Jacob, Jesse Keenan, and it will be moderated by Eric Kleinenberg. To the panelists, I want to point out that Martina over here is going to be keeping time. But can, I, can we move you, Martina, so you can sit in front? Perfect. And if there's a clicker, I don't know if anyone has it. Are you set? Uh, I think so. Okay. Just everyone take their seats. We're going to jump right in with Eric. Okay. Okay. All good. Great. Thank you. Thank you, a a Amy. Thank you, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. So nice to see everybody here. Let me just ask you, you know, um, we talked a lot about design already. And one of the really interesting things um, about this project, Rebuild by Design, is from the beginning, it's include designers in conversation with many other people who aren't always in the room together. Um, my name's Eric Kleinenberg. I'm a sociologist and also the director of the Institute for Public Knowledge at NYU. Uh, I was the research director for Rebuild by Design, and Rebuild by Design has been hosted uh, to some great extent at IPK over the last couple of years, and it's such a nice thing to see it move on to these other institutions uh, in new incarnations. It's wonderful to watch the network grow and experience it. Um, but because what we've learned from working on Rebuild by Design over the years is that it really is an interesting group of people who feel summoned uh, by this concept, I thought it'd be interesting for you just to get a sense of who is in the room. I'm also kind of a sociology geek, so I like to, you know, ask people who they are and to raise their hand so I can count them. Um, but join me in that for a second. Can you raise your hand if you are a designer, you consider yourself in the d design field? What about a, a, a social scientist? Okay. Anyone here who works in a government agency? Uh, a philanthropic group? Community organization? Are there students in the room? <laughs> Any uh, faculty, researchers, yeah. uh, people who work in architecture design firms? All right, it's going to be a really interesting conversation. Uh, we have a terrific panel. When, when you uh, organize a group of academics to talk about any concept, the first conversation is always whether we agree on what the concept is. And of course we don't. Uh, and when you use it, when you t come together to, to talk about a concept as kind of robust and also, dare I say it, a little bit trendy, like resilience, uh, inevitably there's going to be some debate about what it means uh, and what it invokes. And so we thought that before we got into meaty conversations about how to des design any particular place, um, in accordance with some notion of resilience, that we would spend some time thinking about the history of that concept and thinking about the practical life of this concept uh, today as well. And we thought we'd place it in the context, the you know, social context, the cultural context, the environmental context of global warming. And so we have a terrific panel to do that. Um, we have Harvey Malich, a distinguished professor of sociology and metropolitan studies from NYU. Uh, Harvey has won the Lifetime Award from the American Sociological Association for his contributions to urban sociology. He's written many, many uh, influential books from urban fortunes about the political economy of place and urban growth uh, to uh, his most recent book, Against Security, provocatively. Uh, we have uh, next to him Klaus Jacob, uh, who's a geophysicist and a research scientist, professor uh, at Columbia University, uh, at, uh, works at the Lamont Observatory. Uh, I first got to know Klaus when I was writing an article um, after Sandy for The New Yorker about what happened in New York, what broke down, uh, how New York City should think about rebuilding in anticipation of the extreme weather to come. And every single person I talked to said, you have to go meet Klaus Jacob. Um, it turned out that, that uh, Professor Jacob had predicted with eerie precision uh, how this city's infrastructure would break down during a, a catastrophic flooding event. Uh, and before then, people listened to him seriously. And since then, uh, he has made enormous contributions to our collective debate, uh, both in the public sphere, uh, also in many design circles, uh, about how we should think about what he calls pro-building, 
since we can't just build back what we've had before, and we're really lucky to have him. Uh, we also have Jesse Keenan, who works here at Columbia, uh, an expert on uh, real estate, on climate change, on risk issues. And Jesse has worked on it for, for, for governments as well as for major uh, Fortune 500 companies around the world thinking about how we deal with risk and resilience, uh, how we implement resilience projects in the, in the strange, weird world that we live in now. So we have three very different perspectives. Uh, depending on how much time we take, I might even chime in with a few words of my own. And then the goal for these panels is for all of us to, to, to have a, a, a big conversation as well. And I just want to reiterate this point uh, that came up in the introductions. We are here to kind of experiment together and to try to build something that could work as a curriculum together. There's nothing that's set in stone at this point. This whole day, this whole weekend, is about trying to collectively come up with a way that we can teach the most important uh, material in this emerging debate about what resilience means and about how we build moving forward. So let's all make sure that we see that big goal and keep it in mind when we join into the conversation together at the end of the panel. So that's more for me than you needed. Um, I'm happy that we're all here, and I'm especially happy that Harvey Malich is going to kick us off. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, everybody. And um, uh, I was especially interested in the number of students who are here. Um, but in a way, we're all students. This is um, the first day of uh, a, the existence of a university. Uh, so we're all uh, freshmen. Uh, and um, uh, so welcome, fellow freshmen, uh, I guess I should say. Um, so uh, yeah, just a few comments, of course, because there are only a few minutes to, to speak. Um, uh, when we th think about the, um, the stuff that we're going to have to worry with, that we do worry with when we talk about uh, um, things like uh, resilience, um, is the fact that property already exists as markets um, in uh, most parts of the world. Um, and uh, these markets uh, have location. Uh, and this sets up the, uh, uh, the, the particular and peculiar issues of how do we um, alter um, uh, the physical elements of the world and their um, uh, social coordinates, that is the human beings who own them, who live on them, who are associated with them uh, in order to create uh, benign results. Um, and results that they may not be anticipating either in terms of the dangers that they face or in terms of, of the potential for mitigation of those dangers. So the uncertainty that Eric uh, began with his remarks with um, is present in um, almost every move uh, that um, uh, follows on from um, anything like an effort uh, to create resilience. A great difficulty with property markets, I am not the first person to talk about this, is that they are not by their nature uh, given to internalizing the external costs that are created uh, when development takes place. And development, um, even in a already developed society like this one, um, is actually continuously happening. Uh, we are a continuously developing system, um, even through nothing more than routine maintenance. What we have is really the mother of all collective action problems when we talk about things like climate change. How can we generate solutions uh, at the macro level, uh, also at the micro level, uh, given that um, it is often um, in the interests of a lot of people to be free riders, uh, or at least not to um, put forth the effort uh, that is needed to create a collective uh, solution. This problem, this collective action problem, haunts um, all um, environmental efforts. What we need um, is not just readiness of infrastructure, but we need political readiness. That is how to overcome the collective action problem. And it is only through political, uh, with a small p, um, uh, uh, consciousness and action uh, that this um, collective problem can be seen as uh, something requiring uh, a collective solution. And now we face peculiar problems with things like climate change. Uh, the best way to enact a collective solution to mobilize populations uh, is by having uh, war. 
uh, an act of terror. And here in New York at 9-11, we saw the vast mobilization of uh, creating political readiness, um, often in majestic error, which is a, another story. Um, uh, but, um, but it worked to engage publics um, and to set in motion, um, for better or for worse, um, remediating um, act activities. I call it here the dilemma of the acts of terror versus slippery tubs. And I think everyone here probably knows more people die every year from slipping in bathtubs than in acts of terror. But it is very hard um, to move uh, collective energies uh, to deal with things like uh, slippery bathtubs and the many, many other things that I'm using slippery bathtubs as a, a holding for. And instead, the moral panics um, as uh, the reaction to the destruction of the World Trade Center was one, instead tend to uh, rule the day. Or at least they have this higher potential for collective action uh, than the problem of the bathtub or the problem with no name for the uh, uh, people in the room who, who remember that phrase, the problem that is at least difficult to name, the problem of climate change, um, and to have it uh, be something that people uh, grasp. Um, how do we go about um, dealing with all of these things? Well, um, my solution, um, and many of the people in this room know this very well, um, is we have to have multiple goals. Um, and uh, any um, effort uh, to enhance resilience has its best shot when it, um, drama and mayhem not being on the agenda, uh, the best shot um, is by dealing with one goal uh, after another, after another, after another on multiple fronts. So the uh, remit for design then in this case is to um, create solutions that address many felt needs um, and, um, and for, and for the, the many. Um, there's a phrase uh, from a now deceased um, anthropologist at LSE who um, used the phrase, uh, the technology of enchantment. And I think that is a great phrase. He meant that when he was trying to put his child to sleep at night, the fact that the sheets had Mickey Mouse on them meant that he had a better shot um, at getting the kid into the bed. Um, the technology of enchantment translated into a resilience context means that all the elements that are, um, the stories that are told, the representations that are made, um, and the solutions that one come upon, comes upon have to have um, the uh, quality of enchantment, um, of being both aesthetic, um, but also having uh, a, a capacity uh, for doing things like um, housing, child care, or here I've called it berms for better hockey, um, many things that are done at once. And to do it unobtrusively, um, obtrusively um, at times when it is meant to enchant and get a lot of attention, that should be also part of the scenario. But at other times, like good infrastructure always is, or almost always is, utterly unobtrusive so that it is just sailed through without needing to be sold as a morally better thing or even as a solution to a collective action problem. Just something that becomes taken for granted um, either because of its enchantment uh, or because of its obvious utility um, to solving the needs at, at, at hand. Of course, this means deploying all the tricks of the trade of architecture, planning, all the letters of the place we're now in, um, the tricks of the trade, um, visuals, tactiles, mock-ups, videos, watercolors, models, and toys. Watch what you wish for. That's my, uh, my last downer of the day. And um, recycling is my poster child of worrying about getting it because it's apparently good, apparently useful, apparently right. Um, the good news about recycling is that we have millions of people, billions of times a day, all over the world, doing something in an utterly selfless way. Uh, I'm not the only one who's walked around with a plastic bottle um, all over uh, a campus or a whatever, trying to find the right place to put it. Um, 
what a wonderful achievement for humankind. However, um, there are uh, hard-ass facts, which is that um, recycling is trivial in, in its outcome. Um, and the problems that really are motivating our presence today, uh, climate change, have very little, if anything, to do with this great set of um, activities and efforts um, that um, unite um, virtually all the good consciousness, consciousnesses um, in the world. Um, it is not going to, in fact, um, get us out of the dilemmas um, that bring us together. Thanks very much. Today, we're at a critical moment in the study of resilience across a variety of disciplines. In my limited time here this morning, I'd like to briefly explore the diverse origins of the concept of resilience, as well as the future directions of the various meanings and applications of the concept. The ubiquitous label of resilience pervades our everyday lives, from car commercials to Peyton Manning describing his team as resilient following the sideline interview at the Super Bowl. Search traffic over the past decade uh, for the term resilience has more than doubled. Yet what people are searching for is the fundamental meaning and definition of the concept. <laughs> the history of resilience is a history defined by co coexisting evolution across a variety of disciplines, as highlighted in this map of interconnected scientific knowledge. The early conceptual development of resilience was in the field of psychology, with the first published paper in 1973 examining the concepts, uh, I'm sorry, examining the coping capacities of poor children uh, being raised in Hawaii by alcoholic and mentally ill parents. By the early 1980s, juvenile psychology had been extended to a variety of subfields, including organizational industrial psychology, which was struggling to understand the impact of corporate culture on uh, employees, particularly the, in light of the stresses of corporate consolidations endemic to the decade. In its earliest manifestations, psychology was concerned with the mechanisms of returning to a stable and healthy psychological state with a prolonged exposure to traumatic and unstable experiences. At roughly the same time in the 1970s, ecology popularized resilience within a larger body of work developing dynamic systems theory, most notably the adaptive cycle. The adaptive cycle accounts for four evolutionary stages of a natural system, from growth to conservation of capital with high levels of resilience, to release and reorganization of capital with low levels of resilience. In this regard, resilience was conceptualized to be a description for the relative durability of a system to maintain stable performance when, within any given stage of the adaptive cycle. In heuristical terms, like psychology, ecological resilience spoke to the elastic function of a host to maintain a periodic stable state. As natural and human ecologies began to spin off a variety of synthetic areas of inquiries in the 1980s, resilience was co-opted to describe social, organizational, institutional capacities for maintaining or seeking stability in the light of environmental degradation, economic inequality, and natural disasters. It's at this juncture that sustainability, international development, and disaster risk management incorporate various ecological frameworks of resilience. Concurrent with these developments in the early 1980s, civil engineering began to utilize the concept of resilience as a function of reliability and of capacity to, of a system to recover to a pre-shock state of operations. With several generations of engineering driven by efficiency at the cost of redundancy, resilience, resilient systems analysis was deemed a parallel critical evaluation to probabilistic failure analysis. The 1990s also saw the, the proliferation of the development of computer software for the mass market. The push for new pro products was moving faster than programmers could accommodate, and resilience methods from systems engineering were utilized to ensure that software could operate core operations in the face of inevitable coding errors. Leading into the 2000s, the business community co-opted elements of both socio-ecological socio resilience and systems engineering resilience and developed applied frameworks for practices in business continuity. These early practices were initially oriented around supply chain management, particularly in light of the global supply chain disruptions following the 2011 Tohoku earthquake. In returning to the point in time where natural and human ecologies intersect, this is where the epistemological foundations of resilience becomes muddled. In retrospective terms, we can identify two camps of thought. The first camp argued for a unified epistemological 
epistemological foundation of resilience, as it cut across both multiple dynamic processes that impacted both socio-ecological and biophysical processes. The argument was that a uniform, objective, and normative framework for resilience could empower a diverse set of stakeholders and could hence attempt to control for matters of equity and justice. This body of work led to a progressive interpretations of resilience that were incorporated within sustainable and international development. This body of thought, although not entirely consistent, began to view resilience as leading to a future state that was superior to its predicate state. However, there was little agreement as to the parameters of the superior state. The other camp grounded in natural science, ecology, psychology, economics, and engineering argued that resilience should be conceptualized in its limited terms as an elastic function that returns the host to its pre-stimulus state. In particular, the relatively influential field of ecology argued that an exclusive concentration on resilience was misplaced because of resilience's focus on stability for the status quo. In ecology, nothing is stable and multiple dynamic processes will dictate resilience in any given stage of the adaptive cycle is limited. Instead, this collective body of scholarship and practice focused on adaptation, with adaptation being the defined as the capacity or action of a host to shift to an alternative domain of operations along a continuum of both stable and unstable states. In fact, the science of adaptation, which formally includes resiliency, is the international standard recognized by the IPCC and other major scientific bodies, journals, and public policies outside of the United States. However, this point and counterpoint between resilience and the elasticity of the status quo of the short term and adaptation, that is the capacity for transformation generally over the long term, is not well settled in the United States. Specifically, a tendency to conflate adaptation with resilience is not consistent with either scientific knowledge or international public policy experience. Politicians and foundations are biased to utilize resilience because it speaks to the present interests of their constituency. By example, in multiple interviews with federal officials, I've uncovered a powerful political preference of a Republican Congress to use the term resilience over adaptation. Entire units within federal agencies have been renamed with the title resilience in an effort to garner more federal dollars from a Republican-controlled Congress. This, in fact, makes perfect sense, as being a conservative means that you believe in the perpetuation of the status quo. The unified theorist of resilience will argue that resi resilience leads to a superior state. But this superiority is relative to, to, to its context, as one's superiority is often within the conditions and parameters that define one's original vulnerability. As will be discussed, the label of resilient is also a convenient metric of success relative to more amorphic qualities of the process of adaptation. With the competitive pressures for fundraising and the political necessity of demonstrated results, it also makes sense that resilience is a convenient frame for both foundations and politicians. Is it a incumbent upon academics and practitioners to challenge resilience as an absolute good. One should acknowledge that resilience is a process and not an outcome. Resilience is largely descriptive and highly limited or conditioned as a normative proposition. Most importantly, resilience is highly subjective. Some types of actions may be resilient to one person and maladaptive to another. Likewise, adaptation and why one community may undermine the resilience of another. As resilience has proliferated in our popular discourse as an absolute good, so too have the critiques of its intellectual underpinnings as they have been rhetorically utilized in the United States. These critiques fall into one of the following categories. The first set of critiques revolves around complexity and subjectivity. They argue that the complexity of human and natural ecologies are such that any homogenizing framework that promotes stability is destined to fail by virtue of its inability to uh, uh, apply universal truth or application. In fact, this is a very similar argument against the absolute nature of sustainability, given the well-demonstrated empirical phenomenon that stability or st sustainability in one system often comes at the cost of instability in another. The second set of critiques comes from an institutionalist perspective that is perfectly captured in the following quote. One person's, may, one person's resilience may be another's vulnerability. If collective alternatives are not sought, the existing institutions that have contributed to such predicaments are not only remained unchallenged, but are relied upon to steer societal responses based on the same underlying assumptions that first led to the problems. Critics of neoliberalism have taken this critique a step further by arguing that resilience, with its techno-managerial focus, has clouded the necessity for engaging collective responsibility and instead has focused on individual vulnerability. The result is a shift of accountability to the most vulnerable and marginalized. In my dual capacity in public service and in practice, I see this playing out across the country, wherein local communities focus on building technical resilience to infrastructure in, in the built environment, but don't tackle the more fundamental issues relating to land use decisions and environmental justice. However, as highlighted in the National Disaster Resilience Competition, this recognized necessity for making the tough land use decisions is coming to the forefront. 
However, the negative implications of a sole focus on resilience, unified or otherwise, are increasingly coming to light in the empirical research. As Wu and Wu note, it is crucial to note that there can also be a negative dimension of having high resilience. A system can sometimes become resilient in a less desirable regime. For instance, as urban regions besieged by impoverishment may be stuck in poverty traps. The authors go on to note that in many urban areas of the world, and particularly in the developing world, resilience can both act as an, a vehicle of sustainability and as an agent of destitution. In this regard, one can admire the ambition of foundations to break these cycles through progressive unified frameworks of resilience. However, without the political will or the political capital to challenge and transform these institutions as adaptive, the resilience runs the risk of being as disruptive as any transformative actions. For instance, in the field of anthropology, Donald Nelson has found that resilience frameworks have focused, that focus exclusively on vulnerability overlook the organizational structures that created systematic risk and further clouded issues relating to power and access. His research found that those engaged in challenging these structures were often ostracized as being culturally subversive. In Helen Admondson's 2011 seminal work, Illusions of Resilience, an analysis of community responses to change in northern Norway, it was demonstrated that a strong focus on resilience led to a sense of complacency that distracted people from the necessity to adapt to a changing way of life in the rapidly thawing permafrost. In Tweed and Walker's analysis of resilience planning following the Tohoku earthquake in Japan, which could have been a substitute analysis for post-Sandy reconstruction, the authors found that top-down and homogenizing frame, uh, frame of resilience was unworkable given the complexities of bottom-up steering pressures for reconstruction. The authors found that by, quote, building resilience to one form of hazard, we may either with full knowledge or unwittingly amplify vulnerability to another, end quote. For instance, moving settlements through tsunami-prone coastal flats to mountainous hillsides, one substituted resilience to tsunamis for greater vulnerability to landslides. More importantly, Tweed and Walker identified the necessity for, public, for local communities to define the object of resilience. This comes with the proviso that communities that define the object, uh, this comes with the proviso that communities' preference for what should be resilient will change and that one needs adaptive management structures in place to accommodate these priorities. The core challenge then is how and to what extent capital budgeting and other fixed capital decisions relating to planning and infrastructure can accommodate these shifting demands. I'll, ship over, I'll skip over, rather, some of the other empirical research in favor of uh, getting to the point here, which is that our work here today in the built environment falls into one of several categories. We are either concerned with technical resilience of buildings and infrastructure from an engineering perspective, or we're concerned with an emerging field known as community resilience that seeks to work in favor of the collective at a very finite scale. There are no pure divisions here, though, as the operations maintenance of buildings and infrastructure are highly dependent on many social aspects of community resilience. However, to move forward with community resilience is a larger paradigm for action. That is, to move from description, descriptive aspects to normative aspects of the concept, we need to acknowledge a set of conditions. We need, must acknowledge the limited nature of resilience as an elastic function to the status quo with a strong counterpoint in adaptation. For every action of resilience that focuses on vulnerability, we must challenge the equation to consider the cost of adapting the systems and institutions that are partially responsible for that vulnerability. We must acknowledge that resilience is entirely subjective and not an absolute good in its applications. And finally, we must acknowledge that local communities and stakeholders are responsible for defining the aspects of community resilience that should be perpetuated through resiliency and planning. I think I'll skip over some of the additional uh, uh, research that is going on, but I would say in particular uh, something of use that is driving uh, 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 research today is the empirical side, which is looking at the descriptive uh, work, both pre and post event relating to uh, common indicators of economy, housing, public health, that I think will certainly uh, define uh, the resilience as we understand it, in addition to some interesting uh, sociological and social science work relating to the development of Narrative. And finally, I'll conclude with this. While my remarks here today are delivered in my academic capacity, my, in my public service capacity as vice chair of the Community Resilience Panel for Bu Buildings and Infrastructure, a multi-agency federal initiative to harmonize resilience standards and practices, I urge those of you who are interested to check back in the coming months as we launch the Resilience Knowledge Base, which will be a one-stop shop portal for resources that document this merging field of practices. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Jesse, you uh, made it easy for me uh, because I want to focus really not so much on resilience but on adaptation. And if I have a single 
uh, concept that I want to uh, leave you with. It's the scale of time, time horizons, which become extraordinarily important combined with our incapacity as modern societies to be mobile. We are not nomads anymore. We have fixed cities, we have fixed infrastructures. Uh, yeah, so I mean the Earth has been around for a while, a couple of billion years, and there were always extreme events. And then we came as a latecomer to the evolution and uh, what we have lost as we developed civilization and cities and human habitats, we have become accustomed to stay at a particular place. And in the course of doing so, we have forgotten that we are living in a natural, highly dynamic environment. So, some of the cities, if you look from an earth science point of view, are located in almost grotesque locations. Moreover, with development of technology and our ability uh, to harness particular fossil fuel sources, we have allowed to develop mushroom with an explosive demography, uh, population growth around the world that uh, in itself then causes, of course, a change, which we now call climate change. Uh, and it will be very hard to wean us off this uh, new phenomena. And one of the most dramatic impact on humankind will be sea level rise because we have had a tendency to move towards the coast, particularly in a globalized economy. It's convenient to have both production and transshipment all located together to get to the other continents and sell your goods. So while much of the vulnerability of the human society comes nowadays from socioeconomic pressures, it's these extreme events or sometimes slow creeping events like climate change that are punctuated by its extreme events on top of it that uh, really amplify our vulnerabilities in an incredible way. Sometimes they are causative. Syria clearly has a climate change underlying uh, component. Uh, when there was a five-year drought preceding uh, the internal conflicts and displacement of people. Here are a few examples historically and otherwise. Uh, on the left, you see the Black Sea, and uh, uh, there's not a pointer probably, but uh, there's a stippled line in the water where the shallow blue goes into the deep blue. That was the shoreline some 7,000 years ago. Uh, seven, yeah, 7,000 BC, roughly. And then, through the Bosporus, which is in the lower left, uh, the water from the Mediterranean was rising, it was the end of the glacial time, and flooded within relatively short time, and nobody knows for sure what it was, maybe a year, maybe less. That shallow part of the Black Sea, and you see some two uh, black uh, squares there, that's where former villages are now being found on the bottom. These people were the first, if you like, climate refugees. Uh, they moved to Mesopotamia, and uh, it led to the uh, epic of the Gilgamesh, 
in other form, Noah's flood. Uh, on the upper right, you see uh, a man-made disaster. There are boats in the desert. How can that be? Well, it's the former Aral Sea, uh, just a few hundred miles to the northeast of the Black Sea, in which uh, the usage of upstream waters that fed into the Aral Sea are used for cotton and other goods. So no water goes anymore into the Aral Sea, or at least not sufficient to keep up with uh, evaporation. So these fishing villages had to move to. In the lower left, you see uh, the misery of a societal dilemma that pre-existed uh, pre the Haiti earthquake in the year 2010, in which it is clear that resilience was not their first life necessity, that they had to cope with anything that gave them a roof over the, uh, their heads uh, was good, which was, of course, not resilience in uh, the earthquake. On the lower right, it's hard to believe how one can build so densely so far away from any continent in the middle of the Indian Ocean, in the Maldives. What will those people do when sea level rise will subsume them? There is no solution politically for that. Even after COP21, the climate refugee issue has not been addressed. Uh, while this is the uh, history of resilience, how much time do I have? Thank you. I want to look a little bit into the history of the future because I think that's where we can act now and in the future. So I think we truly have to understand and quantify the hazards if we want to uh, be resilient and adapt. We have to understand uh, our vulnerabilities, or the engineers call it fragilities, in the social, but also in the built assets, and really quantify these things. And it is a truly interdisciplinary task. We have learned how to map and quantify the risks that exist now. And we have climate projections and other tools in which we can project them into the future. Yes, with uncertainty, but uncertainty is no excuse for non-action. And then we have to do what we do here right now, uh, that the education and information age lose on the political, economic, and social psychological interplay and see whether we make rational, informed decisions or run like lemmings uh, over the cliff in sheer denial of the obvious. In other words, I think society has to learn again to relate to the extreme dynamic aspects of the Earth, even so some of them are man-made. Uh, some of the tools are simple. Risk can be defined as vulnerability overlapping with the hazards and the exposure, where we place our assets with respect to hazardous conditions, and how vulnerable those assets are as a function of the hazard. That makes risk. And if we reduce this overlap, then we can make progress. On the right, you see a graph that's a little bit hard to understand, but it shows really how the 10, 100, and 5, 700 year storms will increase with sea level rise. If you follow the dotted line where Sandy was flooding, let's say the Battery subway entrance in southern Manhattan, that was a 700 year flood height. By the year 2090, with that sea level rise forecast, it will be a 10-year flood. So a 70-fold increase in 
the risk exposure, a 70-fold increase. The lower right that almost looks like a Maldives uh, an RBD has done a nice job uh, to have one of those projects, the big U. But my point is here that what we do right now is unfortunately good only for 10, 20, 30, 50 years. We have lost the sense that sea level rise in particular, but other climate conditions elsewhere, have a long, long future ahead of us. And we are immobile with our structures. We have to learn to become nomads again. Our infrastructure has to be nomadic. Not sure how you do that. But that's the task at hand. We will not be able to defend where we are as much as we would like it to do. I will skip over the last one. It pretty much states the obvious while I'm leaving the desk here. going to say a few things about resilience that um, really hit home for me over the course of uh, our collective work on Rebuild by Design. Uh, and I hope that that will be a nice impetus for the conversation we have later. You can turn off the slides. Uh, I'm not going to use them. Here's the first thing. Um, to set the context on climate change and, and sea level rise. If I had a magic button in my hand right now, if I could take the pointer that uses, the, you know, that we work for the computer, and I could stop all greenhouse gas emissions globally at this very moment, right now, that, that would be awesome. Uh, but, but it would do very little to stop the process of uh, global warming and sea level rise that we have triggered we would face, at a minimum, decades, perhaps, you know, more than a century. Uh, oh, Klaus is saying more, more, more. Uh, of increased temperatures, of rising sea levels, of higher incidence uh, and severity of these extreme weather events that's, that are punctuating the slow motion disaster that we've started, which tells you that regardless of what you hear about COP21 or any other treaty, we now are in a moment where we have no choice but to adapt. Right? So there used to be a debate in climate change circles about adaptation versus mitigation. And there are many people who wisely warned that if you spend too much time and energy thinking about adaptation, you will undermine potentially support for mitigation, which we urgently need to do, right? You might wrongly give the impression that we can handle this. You know, no need to mitigate because we can just adapt our way out of it, right? And, and that point might not be wrong, and yet we have no choice but to adapt. Second point, we have no choice to adapt, but some people and places have far more capacity to adapt than others, which means that an inherent danger of this next moment when we plan for resilience and adaptation is that some people and places will do it much better and more effectively than others. So are you putting your money on lower Manhattan or are you putting your money on Bangladesh? And now play that out in whatever way you want. All right. So where in the New York metropolitan region are we going to invest collective resources in protection? <laughs> and that laughter says so much. Now, Sandy was interesting, right? Because the, the way we see the world, if we, I don't even have to show you the slide. You know the slide that I would show right now of Manhattan with the power out in Sandy? Right? This south of power, Sopo, right? And then you see Manhattan lit up everywhere around in lower Manhattan. You, you don't need me to show that slide, right? It's in there? Okay, so 
What was mind-blowing about that slide is we have a view of the world in which the power's out in the Bronx, but the power's not out in lower Manhattan, right? So it actually took some time for those of us who live down there to realize, actually, it's not coming back on anytime soon, right? This is the financial center and the power center of the world in some way, and we don't have access to electricity. So there are ways in which we are all in the same boat. Right? It's not as if because you're in lower Manhattan, because you're in the United States, you're going to get through this change fine. We've all learned enough to know that's not true. Right? Partly that's because, as Klaus said, we have put ourselves in harm's way. Right? We've built and developed permanently in grotesque places. I like that term. Um, partly it's also because our critical infrastructures, the ones we have always depended upon, the ones that have proven reliable for quite a long time now, for at least for many decades, no longer seem up to snuff, right? And so it's, it's clear that no one in this room trusts that the power grid will keep on working in the next major extreme event in New York City, right? We, we don't think that the tunnels uh, will be dry. We don't think that the subways work. We, we know that if we live above the sixth floor in a high-rise building, that the water won't come up anymore because the pumps will go down, right? We, we, we now know that these critical infrastructure systems that we have come to rely upon won't necessarily work even here in New York City, right? So in some sense, we're all in it together. And in a way, our collective capacity to work on climate change as this collective action problem that Harvey Mollage talked about hinges on our understanding that we too are vulnerable and yet we all know in this room right that we are so much less vulnerable than others and this is a challenge for all of us who work on this is it inevitable that adaptation will result in heightened inequality will create a new kind of environmental justice problem for the world I think it is inevitable but one of the things that's really interesting about Rebuild by Design, and if you think about the funding, the public funding for the Big U, for instance, is that the, the, this protection system for Lower Manhattan, what got funded first was not the part of the Big U that's on the west side or Tribeca, right, where the wealth is concentrated. What got funded from the government initially was the Lower East Side, where there's public housing and concentrated vulnerability, right? That's not an outcome you get from the market. That's an outcome you get from politics and from the state. So let's not forget about the key role that state institutions play in this moment. Third and final point before our conversation. We're in a design school, and it makes sense to think about the built environment. It makes sense to think about big systems, big infrastructure systems. We've you know, talked about transit and power and communications. But one of the things that um, I've enjoyed so much these last few years through Rebuild by Design is helping to build the concept of the social infrastructure. Right? Because we have seen in extreme event after extreme event and in everyday life that in fact the social infrastructure, the, the conditions of the places where we live, of the institutions and organizations that animate our lives, that give us the capacity to connect with each other, or that might discourage us from connecting with each other. Those conditions of what I've called in my work the social infrastructure can matter just as much as these bigger systems that we spend billions of dollars building. And we ignore them at, at our peril. In Rebuild by Design, we, we made it an imperative for every group submitting a design that they think about multiple benefits of their projects, right? So if you're going to build a berm, it does something more than protect you against water, right? If you're going to build a wall, it should do other things, right? If you look at the Living Breakwaters design that Kate Orff and the SCAPE group uh, have designed for Staten Island, it's not just a way of reducing wave energy, it's also the production of a cultural amenity and a set of physical places that bring people of all ages closer to the water, closer to the ecosystems that we all live in, and closer to each other. And if we build for global warming without taking into account the social infrastructure, we will be missing something fundamental. Not just about how to protect ourselves from the extremes, but also about how to improve the capacity uh, we have to connect with each other to improve our quality of life, our health and well-being, 
all the time. And it seems to me it's inevitable that we, we must, we must develop in that way. Let me ask the panelists to come and join me. Uh, I believe we have some microphones that will come uh, through the aisles. We are recording, um, and it's important for everyone that uh, we be able to hear you. So please don't just stand up if you have a question. Please come. Uh, I, are you gonna? Are you gonna walk? Are we gonna walk around with the microphones? So raise your hand, and we will try to get the microphone to you. Hopefully, we have them on both sides. Okay, Hi. so we have our first question. If you wouldn't mind just introducing yourself, that would be terrific. Sure. I'm, um, I'm Eric Sanderson. I'm a, an ecologist at the Wildlife Conservation Society. <clears throat> and uh, Jesse, you mentioned a little bit some ideas that kind of come out of ecology and environmental science um, in your comments. Um, I think those are really important, and I, I hope in the Rebuild by Design University that, that you take into account that I think all the solutions that we need for resilience are actually written in, in the tome of nature. Nature has been dealing with these issues for two, for four billion years, as, as Klaus would say. And I think all the, we need to just look to nature to see what the kind of solutions are, when you need to adapt, what kind of resilience is there. And that just has to do with the particulars of the nature that you're designed into, um, as well as more general principles like panarchy and the adaptive cycle. So maybe if the panel could reflect on that. I, you know, I know there's a strong emphasis on on social resilience and technical resilience, and that's, that's all very well and good, but I think you can't really solve this problem without taking into account the ecological resilience issues as well. Yeah, I, thank you for bringing up panarchy, because I think that that does have a social translation, and certainly it has in the scholarship from law to social anthropology. Um, what I think is interesting in a school of design uh, is to think about um, uh, the extent to which one engages those natural processes. Um, both as an accretive and a de destructive force, but as a uh, but as a manifestation of that force to utilize that energy, um, and, and in many ways that is a type of adaptation uh, within a larger system. You see that uh, on shoreline and waterfront development. There's engineering that has caught up to that. I think it's a slightly difficult translation in social terms because of our tremendous status quo bias. Um, but I think those who live along any shoreline, along beachfront property, are given greater recognition as there are declining resources to maintain the status quo of beachfronts, will recognize that that uh, harnessing of nature um, is uh, uh, a future we must recognize and must in integrate in terms of our design processes. Uh, I might want to bring Darwin in. I mean, natural selection has been the way nature and life has evolved on this planet. And the question is, with the time scales on which we have induced now climate change, uh, we have to substitute this process that genetically took place with an intellectual process that I think we have not come to grips with. Okay. Uh, any of the projects, when you look here, or globally, yeah, has no concept that sea level rise right now has no upper end. I mean, we wouldn't think of a, a big U as stemming sea level rise. Now, the Netherlands, and the gentleman behind you can tell you a lot about that, uh, thought in the 50s they can do that, and they have done an extraordinary job. The question is, if we don't get this emission thing under control, and therefore sea level rise under control, and, and that means it has to sort of turn around maybe in 200 years or 300 years, instead of rising, it will curve over to flattening. They are troubled with all their technology. I always tell my Netherlands friends, you better be good friends with the French and the Germans and the Swiss up in the Alps. <laughs> Uh, they don't like to hear that. 
Let's, let's uh, take some, some other questions. I think we have one on, on this side. I'm not sure the microphone is on, actually. Okay. Could, could you address the um, issue of uh, how resiliency came to replace sustainability, especially in New York City? Because uh, I remember being in this very room for many years talking about sustainability in the way we're talking about resiliency. How did, it, how did resiliency come about so fast? I, I, I'll say this, and I'll let someone speak to the policy. Maybe Eric's best to speak on the policy side, but it doesn't replace it or supplant it. In fact, there's a closer relationship now between sustainability and resilience than ever before by virtue of the fact that you need sustainable resource allocation to maintain resilience. And you see that playing out at a lot of different scales. So I wouldn't think in such binary terms. I think that's probably right. I, you know, I, I think the humility that's baked into the resilience concept um, is that we are now accepting that, that these extremes, these punishing and dangerous extremes, extremes will be a recurrent, if not a regular feature of the world that we live in. And so we're now planning around uh, catastrophic events in a new way. I think, as Jesse pointed out you know, very sharply, there might also be an interest in resilience because it does have the potential to uh, pass responsibility and accountability on uh, to people and places that have very little capacity to protect themselves. Um, so there's a, there's a funny politics around it. I, it's my view that that's not necessarily the case, that you know, resilience thinking does not need to uh, delegate responsibility uh, in that way. Uh, but I know that it certainly can be used to do it. And I know a number of people who have expressed concerns that if they become the beneficiaries of resilience investments, whether from philanthropic groups or from state agencies, that then they will be expected to take care of themselves in some new way. Um, so I think a challenge for people who are thinking in this domain is how, how do we make sure that this concept can do other kinds of, of work as well? Um, and and I, I think we're going to be debating that for a long time. Um, it's probably going to be the, the outcome of, of resilience projects will be determined in the political sphere, you know, not in the academic sphere. Um, and there's a lot of work to be done. But I, I do think that Jesse is right that um, we're, we're hardly over sustainability. Um, let's, let's continue to take questions. I know we have one on this side. Is the microphone over there? Judith Weiss from Rutgers University. I'm an ecologist, also an estuarine ecologist, and um, there was a project on the re rebuild by design that didn't get funded <clears throat> in the Hackensack Meadowlands. It's an area that I spent a great deal of time studying, and the people who studied it and the environmental groups in the area were very opposed to the plan because it filled in more wetlands. <clears throat> and part of the reason that the Hackensack Meadowlands towns flood all the time <clears throat> is because they were built in former wetlands. And we were very opposed to this plan. The plan did not get funded. I don't think its lack of funding had to do with our opposition to it. But um, we're concerned that the people involved in that particular project did not consult the uh, natural scientists, the biologists, uh, that were involved studying those wetlands. Yeah. And I'm just wondering if somebody can comment on that. Yeah. Are you raising your hand because you'd like to comment on that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm Alex Felsen. I'm an um, ecologist. I graduated from Rutgers also, but I'm a landscape architect. And I think the Meadowlands is a great example of one of these projects that was very ecologically driven and has a long history and legacy of um, land use change and influence and um, raises the opportunity to investigate this challenging role of what, what an ecologist or what a designer can play in relation to um, envisioning land use change and modification strategies for a complex system like the Meadowlands. So the Meadowlands used to be uh, you know, um, fresh water and then it was converted through engineering to salt water, so it's not a natural system exactly. It's been highly modified. 
And I think there's a huge opportunity to think about um, hydrologic management of the Meadowland systems in a concerted and focused way. I think the issue of consulting with ecologists to understand what that kind of approach might be is a, an, is a concern. But there's, there, the idea of teamwork and collaboration is, I think, what the, one of the agendas of this kind of communication strategy. So it's supposed to snowball into broader discussions that can essentially generate direction for humanity. So I think the intentions behind the Meadowland project were really interesting and exciting. I think the communication strategies for how these different perspectives get in play is important. But the Meadowlands itself, because of its history, is a site where this kind of investigation and manipulation can occur in a productive way. Okay, uh, next question on this side, please. Hi, uh, my name is Tor Tors. I'm a New York-based um, real estate person. Um, so uh, my, my question has to do with your experience uh, uh, with regard to engaging the, uh, the, the global elites, uh, the people who have money, who get behind causes and, and put their names and their money behind various efforts. Um, do you see disconnects between what they're interested in, in funding, uh, for example, uh, you know, health in, in, in Africa that boosts population or the education system versus focusing on uh, resiliency issues? I'll jump in and say this. We tend to frame resilience within the context of risk and risk management. The flip side of that is that it's also about opportunity. Uh, and, and it's where there is opportunity in terms of co-benefits, and I think one of the great aspects of resilience that has been framed within RBDU now um, is the understanding of interrelationships and the establishment of co-benefits, and that works in very practical terms and capital stacks for projects between public and private sector. But on the opportunity side, um, there is money to be made from climate change as there is from any manifestation of change. And I think it's in some part about portfolio management, some part about supply chain management. It's a techno-managerial end of the equation that does speak um, not just to managing risk, but managing opportunities. And so there is a strong, um, there's a strong movement within the private sector um, to address this. Because when you look at adaptation, and I, I completed a, and published a case study over several years on Goldman Sachs, because I wanted to know why in that photograph did Goldman Sachs have their lights on when everybody else did not. And in that study, I found, really looking at the literature review of adaptation, with technology. There's all types of manifestations of change, and so there's all different types of adaptations and resilience as a matter of business continuity. Um, that's a well understood phenomenon, and it's as an empirical phenomenon, and it is growing and evolving and maturing in a way where companies are engaged and they see if there are opportunities for, let's say, public co benefits, they will take those opportunities. So I feel very strongly that there's a lot of hope that we will have a, some contribution to the public realm, and certainly that will also come at some cost, and it's, that's a resource trade-off like, like all, all things. So this brings up my fear of recycling. Uh, uh, um, I sometimes think where is our global ruling class now that we really need one? And um, if, if we tune into the uh, uh, Republican con um, uh, events, uh, we can see just how vast the distance uh, between um, uh, some kind of effective consensus of uh, taking future action um, and uh, what um, it does exist in consciousness. And this brings up, uh, this comes up before we think about China um, and India and the, uh, the, the global scale um, that we need some sort of coordination of, of elite authority to uh, be uh, operating on. Um, this is, just, is part of the challenge. We so have time for one last question. That's what I was going to say. Sorry. <laughs> You're really good at that job. <laughs> Hi, my name is Chloe Demirovsky. I run Disaster Recovery Institute International. And uh, bringing up the point about Goldman Sachs and having the lights on, uh, we train and certify those private sector professionals who do that, who do business continuity and risk management, disaster recovery, and all of that. And we bring them together to have this same conversation in parallel 
And I think that this community and that community could greatly benefit from speaking to each other more. So my question is, how do we bring the private sector and the academic communities together in a way that will bring and add value to both sides? It's so important in this particular topic above all others. Uh, Jess had just said it, by opportunities. I mean, there will have to be a lot of new cities rebuilt and a lot of infrastructure. So the financial sector is absolutely crucial that we find the tools. The problem with those things, however, again is the financial sector in particular has a relatively short term. I mean, 30 years mortgage is as, as long an instrument that they have ever invented, okay? <laughs> That's not enough. So we have to have sort of a 100 year climate mortgage to invent in the financial sector. We uh, have packed your day, which means we go right from this panel to the next one. Um, please join me um, in thanking the panelists and getting ready to turn it around for number two.